adventure, sports, outdoors. With host, Harry Canterbury. There I was, back in the wild again. And I fell right at home, where I belong. I had that feeling coming over me again. Just like it happened so many times before. Hi, Harry Canterbury with another edition of Adventure Sports Outdoors. We've got a special show, and I'm here with Dave Barth. Dave, we've got quite a program. We do. Today we're going to talk about collecting firearms from the Battle of Stalingrad. And Stalingrad was... A nasty, nasty Two event. million casualties. It was terrible. Uh, almost uh, 800,000 Germans, uh, 1,200,000 Russians, 40,000 civilians. And this all happened... Uh, between August of 42 and February of 43. 91,000 Germans surrendered and uh, were put in labor camps and only 6,000 made it back home a decade after the war. So this was one of the worst, if the worst, uh, event in uh, modern history with warfare, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Yep, for sure. What are we going to do today? Well, today we have Paul Bishop portraying a uh, private in the German army. And we have Alf Lindenquester portraying a Russian sniper from World War II with all the associated gear to go with it. And then we're going to talk about the values of some of these firearms from uh, World War II. Before we get going on that, I know it, it, it's always interesting. And this is what they call the grease gun? No, Smizer. Ah, this is the Smizer. That's right. It's a, it's a semi-automatic reproduction of the MP38. It's 9mm, 32-round magazine. This is a semi-automatic. You cannot own legally without a machine gun license a real machine gun. So this is a reproduced semi-automatic. So this was made in the United States? Or no, it was made in Germany. Made in it Germany. actually made in Germany. And, and they it, sell new for between five and seven hundred dollars. They fluctuate a little bit. And this is semi-automatic? Semi-auto. Tick, 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 tick. That's tick. right. That's where mm -hmm. it shoots. Um, you've got a big collection of guns and I mean, un you know, unbelievable being in the business for so many years. You used to uh, meet guys that uh, actually picked the guns off the battlefield. Oh, it was, it was great talking to those uh, old World War II vets, and now they're all gone, unfortunately. It's nice to hear stories that you don't read in the history books. And you hear minor details and little bitty stories, and it's just great. Well, you've had guys bring in Lugers over the years. Oh, absolutely. K98s, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I bought them directly from the vet that brought them back. That brought them back. Mm -hmm. it was a, what do they call that? A bring back. I bring guess back. That's what mm -hmm. they call it, a bring back. Mm -hmm. And they all did it. Almost every one of them. Yeah. I know guys that actually packed them away, and the Navy boys got in there before they got home. So they... Oh, they did a lot of trading with the Navy guys. <laughs> Guns and equipment for alcohol. For alcohol, yeah. 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 Same as it is today. Absolutely. It hasn't changed. That's right. So what are we going to do? Where are we going to start? Well, we're going to start looking at some of these firearms, and we'll discuss the values and uh, go from there. That sounds like a lot of fun. Well, hey, stay tuned for a great day. It's uh, June the 2nd or 3rd, I don't even know what day it is, but it's a beautiful summer day here in central Illinois. Adventure Sports Outdoors is brought to you in part by Corsaw Lumber, manufacturers of quality hardwood products, buyers of standing timber in Smithfield, Central Pool Supply, everything from pools to pool tables and much more in Peoria on West Pioneer Parkway. Kelleher's Irish Pub and Eatery, located on Peoria's Riverfront, open 11 a.m. daily. Eastport Marina, one of the only marinas in its class between Chicago and St. Louis, on Mariner's Way in East Peoria. Goodwill, supporting our veterans with job placement assistance, health, housing, and resource referrals, and the General Wayne A. Downing Home for Veterans, all because you shop and donate. And by Lori Feld of Allstate Insurance at their new East Peoria location, next to the U.S. Post Office on the corner at the bottom of Springfield Road Hill. Our thanks to all of these sponsors. 
Today we're going to talk about the Russian uh, soldier and some of his weapons that he used. This is off portraying a Russian sniper in a camouflage smock. He has two ammo pouches, which like the Germans, if you were on the front line, you had two pouches. If you were on the back lines, a lot of times you just had one. He has a crude Russian backpack, which is typical. It binds at the top like a garbage sack and a standard issue canteen, which was the basic gear. His rifle is an actual Russian sniper with a turned down bolt. It's got a crude scope compared to the Germans and uh, some of the American scopes. It, the trigger pull's real heavy, accuracy was marginal, but that was a sniper rifle. The rifle I have is a standard infantry rifle. This was made in 1929. It has an octagon receiver, and they're worth about $50 more than one with a round receiver. They brought a lot of these into the country for under $100. Now you're looking at $250 to $400 on a rifle like this. We'll show them the uh, pistol. And then we have a Russian Gant revolver. And uh, this one was made in 1939 by the Tula Arsenal. What interesting feature on this revolver is when you cock the hammer, the cylinder moves forward and seals the breech. But it's still a crude revolver, you know, with uh, marginal uh, quality. They made it, this in double action and single action. The Russian officers got double action, and the standard Russian soldier that was issued this gun was issued it in single action. That's because if the Russian officer came upon him and they were gonna have a gunfight, like he was ordering to do something, the Russian could just pull the trigger and fire the weapon, where the individual soldier had to cock the hammer. The Russians also had machine guns. Again, you can't own them, but they made a lot of semi-automatic versions or a converted machine gun into semi-automatic and sold them uh, retail. This, I believe, is a PPS-42. It's a 30-round magazine in the caliber 7.62 by 25. Real fast rate of fire. The Germans love to recover these because they functioned flawlessly. It was a really good weapon. Off has a DP-28, the caliber 7.62 by 54, and it's got a drum magazine. I believe it's a 70-round drum magazine with the same sight as the 9130. This is a Russian PPS-41. It has a longer barrel to be legal for the Federal uh, Gun Control Act. The caliber 762 by 25. It was fed with a drum magazine, which was a quick interchangeable magazine, and uh, it was a very fine submachine gun. The value of these weapons is determined by um, the condition, the quality, the bore condition. A DP-28 like this, at today's prices, you're looking at probably three to $4,000. A PPS-41 like this, you're probably 800 to 1,000, maybe a little better. The Russian sniper rifle, you're talking 800 to $1,500, depending on originality, condition, matching numbers. Uh, it all makes a difference. The standard infantry rifle, which these used to be pretty inexpensive, under $100, now you're looking at 250 to $400. The PPS in 7.62 by 25, they're making these today and they're in the five to $700 range. And then the Gantt revolver, these used to sell for under $100. Now they're in the 250 to $400 range. Now we're gonna talk about German weapons. This is the standard infantry battle rifle. It's a 98K Mauser. The caliber's eight millimeter. It holds five rounds. And uh, you work the bolt for every cartridge. When it's empty, the bolt locks back. And the value on these is determined by the condition, the matching numbers, bore condition. A standard rifle without uh, matching numbers, they start at $500 and go up. A rifle like this with all matching numbers start at $1,000 and go up. Again, condition, your manufacturer, uh, the maker, it all makes a difference in the value. When the Germans captured a country, they also captured their weapons factories. And this was made in Czechoslovakia. It's a G3340. It's got a steel reinforced butt plate. Again, eight millimeter, five shot, and uh, made by uh, the code is DOT for the manufacturer in uh, uh, Czechoslovakia. And the value on this rifle is probably in the thousand to two thousand dollar range, depending on condition. Then we have kind of a low grade sniper rifle. It's a German ZF 41. It has the sniper scope attached to the rear sight. Again, eight millimeter. And the stories behind this, whether it was a sniper rifle just made for close range shooting because the scope is pretty marginal, or that they gave them to guys that couldn't shoot. 
so they give them an optic on the rifle so they could hit something. The value on this rifle is probably $2,500 to $3,500. Again, you got to keep in mind the matching numbers or condition all makes a big difference. And this is a German high turret sniper rifle in 8 millimeter. It has a lot better optics. In fact, a lot of the glass uh, came from uh, Japan, five shot, eight millimeter. And this is a typical sniper rifle uh, used in World War II. Value on this rifle is in the three to $5,000 range probably. You cannot own a full auto MP38. This is a MP38 Smizer, nine millimeter. 32 round magazine. This is a current made semi-automatic rifle. They sell for between five and $700. So you can't have the real thing, but close to it. It just does not have a stock. It's it classed as a handgun. Now we'll look at pistols. When the Germans captured Belgium, they also captured the Browning plant and they continued to make the Browning high power. And it's a nine millimeter, 13 round magazine, matching numbers. This is the original holster, but some GI captured it, cut it down. This was actually a Luftwaffe holster. It had a spare magazine pouch on the front. And uh, value on this handgun, they range from $1,000 to $2,000. Another Browning handgun is the model 1922. It's a 32 ACP made by uh, Browning, and this one has uh, German acceptance proof marks for the German Army. Again, that increases the value. Later in the war, they replaced the German Luger with a P38. It's a nine millimeter double action, has a manual safety, and uh, it's actually a, probably a better design than the German Luger as far as functioning, uh, maintenance, or replacement of spare parts, and overall reliability. This is an original holster. The holster itself is worth probably $150 to $250, depending on the year and the maker. The handguns range in price from probably $600 to $1,500. Now we'll take a look at a German Luger. These were developed before World War I and continued production into World War II. It was 9 millimeter. This one is made in 1942 by BYF is the code, which is Mauser and uh, just a classic looking design. You see these in the movies all the time. A uh, handgun like this with matching numbers, you're looking at $1,000 to $2,500 range. If it's not matching, under $1,000. The holster again has value, $250 to $350 on the holster. Fun to shoot. In the German Army, normally, the higher the rank, the smaller the handgun. And uh, this is a PPK. The caliber is 32 ACP, it's double action like the P38, it has a manual safety and a spare magazine pouch on the holster. The value on something like this is probably in the $1,000 to $2,000 range in that ballpark. On the motorcycle here, we have an MG34. It's an eight millimeter belt fed machine gun. They replaced it with the MG42, which is probably one of the finest machine guns in the world. The Russians, the Germans, the Americans love to capture this weapon because in World War II is probably the finest belt-fed machine gun on the market. This is a semi-automatic version, uh, brought in probably about 20 years ago, and the value on something like this is in the four to $5,000 range. Now we'll throw it to Paul, Paul Bishop, and he will describe his uniform and gear that he has on. Thank you, Dave. Well, for weapons here, we've got the potato masher hand grenade to use. It's a little bit different than pulling a pin like on the U.S. pineapple grenade. You have to unscrew this cap on the bottom, and there's a ball on a string here. You grab a hold of that ball and rip that out of here, and that ignites the fuse, and you can use the leverage of the stick to throw the grenade. So that's the way the uh, potato masher grenade works. And again, that's a reproduction. They, make, they still make those today. As far as the uniform, we've already learned about the K98K standard infantry rifle. And these are the Patronentaschen for the five round clips. So you get, you'll hold 30 rounds each and your, your frontline infantrymen would carry two pouches of this. So you have, have the 60 rounds of extra ammunition with it. 
Uh, this is the dog tags, quite a bit different than what you see for the Americans. And instead of having two dog tags, you've got one dog tag that breaks in two. So that's the Erkennungsmarke that the Germans had. Around to this side, we've got the entrenching tool, or Schanzzeug, or Spaten, and the bayonet, which they also call a sidearm, or Zeitengewehr. In back, there's a cylinder on my back, and that's the gas mask canister, and there's a pouch on there, and that's for the uh, cover that goes over your head uh, to, to give a better seal from the gas attacks, which really didn't happen in World War II. On this side here, we've got the Brotbeutel, or the bread basket, where the soldier would carry whatever he needs to have with him, his personal effects and such, and maybe some food, hence the name bread basket, the bread bag. And here is the mess kit, and the Feldflasche here, or canteen, with the Trinkbecker on top, much smaller than what the Americans had, so you much easier to uh, conserve your water when you're out in battle. And now we have some extra German gear that was used in the Battle of Stalingrad. Paul will describe what we have here. Okay, as you know, the Battle of Stalingrad that lasted more than a year, so it wasn't always cold in Stalingrad, but when we think of it, we think of the Winter War over there and how, and how miserably cold it was for the Germans and Russians alike. Gave a big advantage to the Russians and a disadvantage to the Germans. But this is some of the gear the Germans use to stay warm during that time. So here we have the felt boots or felt stiefel that they use, kept it quite warm. Wool gloves, the uh, number of stripes indicate the size of the glove, three is the largest. This is a toque, just kind of a hollow tube there you can pull over your head and neck to stay warm. Wool sweater, pullover, actually the Germans use. Here we've got a set of jacket and pants here that are snow camouflage on one side reversible to their splinter tarn or the splinter pattern camouflage for the verdant times of the year. A wool scarf. We've got the Stahlhelm, of course, and for the winter they would either whitewash it with white paint or put a white cloth cover over that. And on the far side, the great coat or mantle that would be used when it's not quite cold enough for this heavy duty uh, reversible jacket. You know, we uh, had a really neat uh, explanation of a lot of the weapons that were used at Stalingrad and all through World War II by both uh, armies, Russian and German. Um, and there's something that needs to be said that we don't talk about very often, and that is, well, why do we like these guns? Do we glorify war? Do we do this in, in some remembrance of the, the warriors that fought on these battlefields? And the answer is no. When you look at a gun, you're looking at a piece of machinery, and it's actually a work of art. Uh, Dave's in the gun business, has been for many years. His father was in the gun business, and his son is now in the gun business. But we don't look at it as instruments of killing. We look at them as instruments of art, of machinery, and also the historical significance that these guns participated in. And if we forget about the history of our country, about what happened many years ago, we will forget and not do justice to the future of this country. And Dave, I think we're on the same page. We both have a passion for weapons. We love looking at them, we love shooting them, but there's more to it than that. Oh, absolutely. In fact, everyone that was involved in Stalingrad, pretty much they're all gone. The only thing left are these weapons to show that you know the battle it's did happened. happen and you know it's a significant, like you said, artifact from uh, that era. And, they, and you can't uh, whitewash history. It is what it is, good or bad. And to understand that is an obligation of every uh, American to know what happened, when it happened, and how it happened. Can never forget. We can never forget what uh, good or good and bad. And uh, by showing you these weapons that were used in one of the bloodiest uh, events in, the, in during World War II, uh, it's a remembrance of just how terrible war really is. My son was a Marine, my dad was a Marine, my other son was in the Army and the military police taking prisoners in Iraq. So we've got, our family has a long line of, uh, of uh, very uh, honorable uh, service to this country and of course your brother was in the military and did many, many things himself. Right? Two of my brothers were in the military, a submariner and uh, my one younger brother, Chuck, is still in the military. Yeah. Well, I want to thank these guys for coming in. Uh, it, uh, this gentleman here, hear a little bit of an accent and tell uh -huh. everybody where you're from. I'm from Sweden. 
And yes. you came here to work for Caterpillar. Yeah, I actually came for college, and I ended up staying. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up working for NASA, and then later on for Caterpillar. Do you uh, ever go back to Sweden? I do, yes. I do visit family <laughs> and friends from, yeah. from 40 years ago now. Yeah, I'd like to go there. Say it's a beautiful country. It is a beautiful country. And this gentleman here, Mr. Bishop, he speaks fluent German. Of course, when he did his thing on the, all the, he knew all the names and all that stuff. Now, why do you know German so well? What was it? Is it was it? I tell you what, I took Spanish and I can I can do about ten words <laughs> in high school. But you've got it down. Is there a passion for speaking another language? Well, I, I think there is. I think there's a, there's a lot of uh, benefit in learning a foreign language. It keeps your mind active. But uh, it also, it, I've got German background. You know, family wise, uh, nearly all my ancestors came from Germany, and uh, so I took. German classes in high school, a little more in college, and then uh, on several trips to Germany, I've had a chance to polish that up. But I'm also an uh, active member in the Peoria German American Society, so I get a chance to practice. Dave quite and a bit I go there, there many times. We do. My mother was uh, German, and my father was Scotch and English. But uh, um, I, I don't know too many people that don't have German in them. Every farmer, it seems like, in the United States is is German, especially right here in Central Illinois. A lot, of, a lot of German folks are really, yeah, It's really definitely the largest uh, ethnic uh, percentage of this part of the country. This part of the country, yeah. Very mm -hmm. industrious, hardworking, and great people. Uh, German folks, uh, which I am part of, I consider us uh, pretty good folks. Absolutely. <laughs> That's right. Hey, now we're going to do some shooting over Dave's brothers. This is a Russian 9130. It was made in 1929. Again, it has the hex receiver and shoot 7.62 by 54. It holds five rounds. You can load it with a stripper clip or load it by hand. And we're ready to shoot. Well, this is the German main battle rifle, the K-98K, K for carabiner or carbine. The 98 is for the 1898 model of the action of the rifle. This rifle was actually considered the best weapon in both the 19th and 20th century. It's, it's a very fine rifle, and it's loaded by opening the bolt, taking a five-round stripper clip, sliding the five rounds into the magazine, and the stripper clip pops off and you close the bolt. Quick as that. It's a highly patented system and very effective. This is a German MP38 semi-automatic 9mm with a 32 round magazine. Load the magazine, insert it, and then chamber around and we're ready to go. Full hard. Pull hard again. You have three more. Yeah, aim for a log. Yeah, whatever you want to shoot. Yes. Okay. Now, was that fun or what? Yeah. <laughs> That's it. 
Dave, there's a little bitty target out there. That's an empty can sitting on top of a log. That's a very small can. It's a very small can. Uh, good luck. Uh, any, any wagering on this? Uh, yeah, 50 cents. <laughs> they, that means he's not real sure. I might hit it. I've got a K98 8 millimeter, and uh, this is a typical World War II German infantry issue. And uh, we wear earplugs. These things are loud. Here we go. I just lost, you just lost 50, 50 cents. cents. <laughs> Keep the log off the top of the other one. Now you hit it. Last shot. Now you hit it again. It's kind of a hollow log, so you are hitting it. Wonderful gun, and like I was saying, these are works of art. The Germans were master machinists. They made these by the millions, and every one of them is just like this one, a smooth action. I have a Browning model 1922 and 32 ACP, and Paul has a German P38 in nine millimeter. Let's see if they work. Adventure Sports Outdoors is brought to you in part by Corsall Lumber, manufacturers of quality hardwood products, buyers of standing timber in Smithfield, Central Pool Supply, everything from pools to pool tables and much more in Peoria on West Pioneer Parkway, Kelleher's Irish Pub and Eatery, located on Peoria's Riverfront, open 11 a.m. daily, Eastport Marina, one of the only marinas in its class between Chicago and St. Louis, on Mariner's Way in East Peoria. Goodwill, supporting our veterans with job placement assistance, health, housing, and resource referrals, and the General Wayne A. Downing Home for Veterans, all because you shop and donate. And by Lori Feld of Allstate Insurance at their new East Peoria location, next to the U.S. Post Office on the corner at the bottom of Springfield Road Hill. Our thanks to all of these sponsors. It's always a lot of fun to be around Dave and Paul, and... Uh... Dave, has got, you got quite a collection of these guns, and I you've been doing it for how many years now? 35 years. 35 years. You've seen a lot of stuff come and go. Yep. A lot of stuff. And uh, just to be around these antiques, because these are definitely antiques, these are 75 to 100 years old, Absolutely. these K98s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a lot of guys hunt game with these today, don't oh, they? Oh, sure do. You Absolutely. Know, it's it's, it's a, about like a 30-06. About like a 30-06. Mm -hmm. It really is. But I want to thank you, both you guys, for a great... Uh, Great afternoon out here in uh, the country. And uh, we'll do this again real soon. Sounds good. Okay. Hey, we'll see you next month.